So welcome everybody to another Behind the Theme. Today we'll be talking about Sekigahara again. And today we'll be talking about the ramifications of the campaign of Sekigahara, of the protagonists involved. Today's part will be about the losers of Sekigahara. And next week we're talking about the victors of Sekigahara. So let's get into it. Now the first thing to note is that the Mogami and Date troops who were fighting the Oesugi in the eastern side of Japan did not know that Sekigahara had been won. And they actually had continued to fight even after the date of the Battle of Sekigahara. And they won. Now going back to Tokugawa's headquarters. After the battle, the first general to see Tokugawa Ieyasu in his field headquarters was Kuroda Nagamasa. Now, Nagamasa was then given Ieyasu's personal wakasashi, or rather, short sword. Now, on a certain side tangent, this is a great honor. You have to understand that the history of many of the Japanese culture and all that originated, naturally to say, from the Chinese one. And not to make this a lecture on the topic, the Chinese emperors used to present their sword to generals on the field to represent that they had the authority of the emperor. This case is somewhat more different. Doesn't mean that Nagamasa had the authority of Tokugawa Ieyasu, but, but just in contrast to the Chinese culture, this was a great honor. And in fact, Tokugawa Ieyasu said when he presented the wakasashi to Kuroda Nagamasa, he said that the Kuroda will want for nothing as long as the Tokugawa flourishes. So I think that speaks for itself to the act of how much the Kuroda are getting out of this situation. Then Ionao Masa was helped in to the field headquarters to see Tokugawa Ieyasu. Now he had to be helped in because as you remember, he had been shot in the shoulder by Shimazu troops, accompanied by Matsudara Tadayoshi, which was Tokugawa's fourth son. And Eho Namasa said to Tokugawa Ieyasu how much Matsudara Tadayoshi was like a hawk of fine stock. But yet Tokugawa, the witty man as he is, also said that even the finest stock of hawks needs a good trainer. Representing the fact that yes, Matsudara Tadayoshi did very well in the battle, but it was only because he was trained so well by Eho Namasa and his red devils. Now the sad part is that this wound, even though he was surviving past the battle, had complications and... Ionamasa basically died 18 months after the battle due to many who would speculate to this shoulder wound. Then after, to what must have been a very awkward meeting, the daimyo of the Kobakawa, the clan who had to choose who to betray, basically the Western Army or the Eastern Army, came in to see Tokugawa Ieyatsu. And he, the young man, the daimyo of the Kobakawa, Hideki, apologized to Tokugawa about Fushimi. Now, if you really go back to the near the start of the series, you remember that um, Fushimi was the castle held by Tokugawa Ieyasu's almost childhood friend and was killed there defending it. So Kobakawa apologized for that and Tokugawa forgave him. But you can tell Tokugawa Ieyasu did not fully trust him because to deal with the situation and the fact that Ishida Mitsunari had actually escaped the battle, he sent Kobakawa Hideki and the other Western defectors along with some other troops to go siege and take down Sawayama, which was Ishida Mitsunari's home base, making sure that even if they had second thoughts of again turning to the Western Army, this one act will forever. Any chance of alliance against the Tokugawa will be a bad idea regardless. And also it was a good test of Kobakawa Hideki's loyalty, seeing as can he put down the man he was supposedly supposed to help. Now then Hidetada turned up, and if you remember, Hidetada was the heir to the Tokugawa family and son of Tokugawa Ieyasu, obviously. And he had taken 36,000 men and basically turned up late to the battle due to a siege which need not happen. Needless to say, Tokugawa refused to see him. And it was until much later, after the viewing of heads, that Tokugawa Ieyasu finally relented and saw his son and gave him a severe trashing verbally. And in relation to the viewing of heads, massive this battle is in Japanese history. In the Western Army alone, 40,000 heads was collected. I don't think Tokugawa Ieyasu saw every one of them, but even regardless, that head viewing must have taken quite a while. Now it's at this point, everything was basically then a wrap-up, that as Tokugawa was progressing on Osaka, where Mori Terumoto, the official head of the Western forces, and Toyotomi Hideyori was, that there was a flurry of letters between Terumoto and Ieyasu, and Mori Terumoto agreed to the terms of Tokugawa, but it was not as what the Kikawa clan had planned. Now, a bit of a quick um, refresher, the Kikawa had actually made the deal that the Mori would not join Ishida Mitsunari at the right time, and thus, hopefully, then the Mori will be forgiven for joining the Western Army. 
Unfortunately, Tokugawa could not forgive that, and actually with good reason. The reasoning is that if Mori Terumoto truly did not want to join the Western Army, he wouldn't head the forces of the Western Army, which was something he could not forgive. Because basically the face of the resistance against Tokugawa was the Mori at this point. And thus he feigned ignorance on the Kikawa deal and took the most profitable lands of the Mori and gave it to the Kikawa clan. Now you must imagine how awkward this must have been because the daimyo of the Kikawa obviously did not plan that. He, to all aspects to what I read, the Kikawa daimyo was truly doing this on a basis of loyalty to the Mori. And now there's this level of the Mori from what is happening could be saying that, oh, look, the Kikawa actually are not that loyal because all they wanted was actually our lands. And thus, there's actually now a conflict between the Kikawa and the Mori in terms of politics, extremely smart on Tokugawa's part. And to give a number on this, the Mori lands for 1.2 million koku was reduced to 360,000. The rest of a lot of the lands was passed on to the Kikawa and so on. On the side note also of surrenders, the Christian daimyo, Konishi Yukinaga, surrendered himself to Kuruda Nagamasa, a fellow Christian daimyo, thinking probably he would get at least some leniency to a certain extent. But, strangely, he was offered to commit ritual suicide, seppuku. Anyone who knows Christian religion knows that suicide is a sin. And obviously, Konishi Yukinaga refused it. And, strangely, as a fellow Christian, Kuroda Nagamasa did not even allow him to see a priest. Now on to another very interesting story to what happened after the battle was the capture of uh, Ishidan Bisunari and he was captured and of course sentenced to be executed. And on his way, escorted obviously as a prisoner to Kyoto to be executed, along with one of the towns he was presented persimmon juice by the townspeople and Ishidan Bisunari refused it on note saying, and this is one of the more popular stories, that it was not good for his digestion. Now Yukinaga, also on his way to be executed, pointed out that they were going to die in about an hour, so it shouldn't really matter. At this point, Ishida Mitsunari made a very good point, which I still like. He said that on the contrary, you never know how things will turn out. It's almost the same as when Tokugawa, after the battle, put on his helmet saying that after victory, one should tighten the cords of his helmet. Basically, Meaning that no matter the situation, one should always be prepared and you never know what might happen. But still as prepared as he was and as good a point that he made, he was still beheaded along with Yukinaga and the rest. And one of the very less known facts is what happened to someone who did a lot of the fighting at um, Segigahara, Ukita Hideie. He actually disappeared and his lands were given away. And it was only three years later that he was found in... Satsuma, which is the Shimazu lands, in 1603, and he was only found out when, when Shimazu Iehisa, the daimyo of Satsuma, gave him up. And of course he was sentenced to death, but at that point I guess Tokugawa had mellowed somewhat, and the death sentence was commuted to a exile. He survived all the way to the age of 84, the literal last daimyo of the Battle of Sekigahara to die outliving all the daimyo in that battle. Now, to the victor goes the spoils. From 90 families, 6.5 million koku was taken away from them, or rather confiscated and given to whoever Tokugawa Iyasu wanted to give it to. And even the families, they were punished more lightly by the Tokugawa. Still had the problem was that now they were out of the influence circle of the Tokugawa, which will have long-term ramifications even to the end of the shogunate. And this was represented in the system of the Fudai and the Tozama. The Fudai were basically the families that were loyal and fought with the Tokugawa, of which there were 176 families. And the Tozama were the turncoats who had turned to the Tokugawa during the campaign. Of this, there was 86 of them. In conclusion, so that was about the losers of the campaign of Sekigahara and the ramifications of Tokugawa's victory on them. Next week, we'll be talking about the victors of Sekigahara and you'll see why I put that in inverted commas. So thank you very much. Till next word.